So, somebody decided to call this channel Tea with Rosie. Well, I'm going to let you all into a little secret. I don't have a cup of tea today, so we're going to try something different. So today, it's going to be Read with Rosie. And this will carry on, um, like, once I've got a cup of tea bag, I'll occasionally do, like, a Read with Rosie from now on. I think it's going to be cool. And anyway, to start this off, I'm going to read to you the prologue and first chapter of my own book that I have recently published, uh, called Casting Shadows. So, so it is all self-made. I wrote it. I edited it badly, and there's a reason for that. I am highly dyslexic, so the link for this book is going to be down below, but little disclaimer, there are some spelling mistakes in there still. Uh, I noticed a couple the other day when I was just flicking through it, and uh, basically when I'm editing it, editing it on the computer, I just can't see the spelling mistakes, I just can't see them, and a lot of them are typos, um, and when I'm going over it, editing it, I just can't see them. That's the way dyslexia affects me. Um, like, I can't read properly, basically. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I am going to go over it soon and probably, like, update the published edition. Or, but, like, for anybody who wants to buy it before that, it is up for sale. So, without further ado, I'm going to start this little a reading session and if you like this video and you want me to do more on books that I've read and I can give like a little review about them as well we can do that comment down below like this video please subscribe as well it will be so amazing uh, I really enjoy doing these videos it helps me mentally so so much and without further ado let's get started so we are back and about to do a little bit of reading. So like I said, I'm going to read the prologue and the first chapter of this book. Oh, you can probably see the cover a bit better now that I'm a bit further away. That's the back cover and the front cover. I did all the artwork myself. Uh, as you can tell, it's probably not the best book cover in the world, but I'm still very proud of it. And before I start, I just want to mention that, like I said, I'm highly dyslexic. And it doesn't really affect my writing, but more my reading, so I apologise in advance if my reading is really shoddy and hard to understand, but I'm hoping that doing some of these videos from time to time will improve that a lot and improve my confidence to be able to read out loud. Um, so yes, let's get started. Prologue. Power and world domination had cost the planet everything it had to offer the human race. Once all the oil had been pumped out of the ground, fracking was legalised in every country, causing wars, demonstrations and strikes all across the globe. This first energy war killed off a quarter of the world's population, and this was only the start. Even though the opponents were abundant, those in favour seemed to outnumber them, and the fracking pushed on, as well as the wars. The people blamed everybody except, except themselves. The truth was, they were all in the wrong. But one group of people stood out in all the chaos. These, those who had first legalised fracking, those who had stepped forward during the, oil, the final oil crises and proclaimed themselves leaders of the world. The elites, as they were called, only thought about one thing though, control. The well-being of the planet, or even the people, was not important to them. They lived, they lived away from all the wars and noise of the dying world, in big enclaves nobody could locate, guarded by military soldiers. Fracking, the fracking lasted four years, four years in total, during which the natural environment was destroyed beyond repair and the population was a quarter of the size it had been before the final oil crisis due to war, famine and even natural disasters. The, war was un the world was unrecognisable. It was all but a mass of concrete and earth. Now, 
the world had to find a new energy source to provide for their extravagant living. So they turned to the only thing left that could be of any use to them, the sun. People were forced and sold into slavery in factories owned by the elites to build photovolvic panels that they covered the world's surface in. These panels supplied energy to the one remaining city in the world, El Gore. It had been it had been built under duress of the elites. They promoted it as a safe zone away from all the dangers of the dying planet. This was the apocalypse in all its beauty. The elites herded the remaining people into the Sun City, where on entry they were injected with an electrobiological organ. These were made to secre secrete a genetically modified neurotoxin that was supposed to calm you. The theory was that these implants came to life when people had bad thoughts and that they and that they would limit crimes. Unfortunately, the people soon realised that these that these organs weren't a hundred percent effective, but more along the lines of two hundred and fifty percent, and at the same time only fifty percent. They set to work even when you slept. Only these implants only worked on the conscious mind. So bad dreams triggered a secretion due to the body's reaction to the dreams. Only the neurotoxin had no effect on the source of this trigger because, because it was of the unconscious part of the brain. The man-made organ then went into hyperdrive, slowing the heart down before, more and more as it did so until the person died. On top of this, opponents to the system soon discovered that the deaths claimed to be down to faulty implants turned out to be murders. The elites had control over our lives. A push of a button and we were goners. My father had fought against the elites in many wars all over the world. Once Elgor had been established, he had no choice but to succumb to their authority for the time being at least. He was 25 at the time. But by the time he was 38, it was time to fight once more. A resistance had formed and the both of us had been able to escape the clutches of the elites to join them in the underground. I was eight at the time and un unable to accompany my father to the battlefield. So he left me in our small new home, alone with just a quilt and a huge amount of books. I had been terribly scared and for days refused to sleep. I nearly turned nearly turned me mad until the people of the underground came to me and helped me through these troublesome years. They brought me food and other supplies and in exchange I tended to I, I tended as best I could to the wound to the wounded once I was slightly older. I think we all knew deep down that my father would not return from the fight, but that didn't make it any easier to accept. The revolution pushed on. The elites, in all their glory, forced children as young as 11 and 12 into intense military training to keep up with the resistance. To keep up with the resistance that had grown tremendously since the start of these violent attacks. So much so, they overtook the elites in numbers 10 to 1. For, for after a year and a half, civilians had started losing faith in their supreme leaders, who no longer even tried to care. The only thing they wanted was total control over what was left of the world and the human race. Technology though wasn't as reliable then and more soldiers died from faulty equipment than they did in combat which gave us an advantage point. Unfortunately it was the resistance's only advantage. Faced with weapons far more f efficient the freedom 
the freedom fighters were slowly being wiped out as much as the trained soldiers. The fighting took place on the outskirts of the city, destroying vast areas of buildings. The great wall that once surrounded the city had been destroyed, creating an easy entry an easy entry for the city's enemy. Families were made homeless, businesses collapsed, and workers started to worry about how they were they would feed their children. The resistance was trying to cut off as many vital supplies as they could pushing the people of the outskirts to leave the city and join the underground. Some did, others turned to the elites for help. They had no choice but to show some affection and sympathy towards the citizens, knowing that if they didn't, they would join the enemy. All was getting too much. All was getting too much for both sides. The resistance was struggling to enlarge the underground fast enough for the newcomers as well as keeping up with the fighting and technology. The elites were struggling to find new soldiers and food supplies. Slowly, the, fighters, the fighting came to an end. Many bodies lay discarded around the city for hungry civil, civilians to feast on. Others had undoubtedly been taken prisoner by the elites. I waited for days, standing outside the door of my house watching injured men and women return but the person i was looking for never came back okay let's try this one last time i got disturbed there by my mum coming back home so chapter one there was a heavy knock at the door i sighed thinking it was ronan who had forgotten his keys again he had only forgotten them once before, but it had been a humiliating experience. I didn't want to be the unfortunate thing standing between hit the knife he held in his hand and the wall he used to throw things at. It had been soon after we had met. He had wanted to leave and return to life above ground, finding life in the tunnels far too oppressing. So one day, a couple of weeks after he had fully recovered and was able to walk once more, he left without a word. I hadn't thought twice about it. I had, expected him, I had expected him to leave sooner or later, just like everybody else. After all, patients are not meant, made to stay forever. That day, I had been out. I can't remember what I had been up to, so I'm not going to say any more about it. And on my return, he was there, curled up in front of the door, sitting on the damp ground. At first glance, I thought it had been some unfortunate individual looking for medical attention, or maybe just a bed to sleep in. But as I got closer, he uncurled his head, snarled slightly, and declared, I forgot my keys, man. He never admitted that he had decided to leave that morning, but he didn't really need to. The evidence said everything I needed to know. He wasn't the thoughtless kind of person that forgot keys. Life above ground was life above ground for a fugitive like him with no ID and limited violence control was close to impossible. He had only left that morning. It it would be strange that he was already back from work, and it was partic a particular. He had only left that morning. It would be strange that he was already back from work, and it was a peculiar time for patients to be knocking on the door, unless it was an emergency, or Ronan had turned the job offer down and had gone to offer a drink. There was always that possibility. I slid out from between the tall, unstable bookshelves where I had been searching for a medical dictionary and looked across at the hooks where our keys hung. There were no keys there. There were no keys there but mine. Ronan was not standing on the other side of the door. This reassured me, knowing that I wasn't about to find him bleeding to death on the floor. This reassured me, knowing that I wasn't about to find him bleeding to death on the floor. It wouldn't have been the first time. Let's face it. 
late night fights with some drunk sod who hadn't nowhere to go, late night f fights full stop, violent arguments with his boss, in fact any number of things could lead to Ronan lying outside the front door half dead. I climbed the stone steps that led to the entrance and went to open the big door with the great metal locks. A girl with long fine white hair lit wearing a blood soaked dress fell into my arms just like a feather. I looked around to see if anybody was there but no one was in sight only the distant sound of feet hitting the puddled underground floor hit my eardrums. Ronan. I quickly pulled her inside before anyone saw because things like this were quickly spread about the underground and were even more quickly mistold. I lay her on the small bed covered I lay her on the small bed covered with a grey blanket in the corner of the room and examined her. The blood was pouring slowly out of a, a huge cut along her arm with impressive bruising all around it. Some other minor injuries on her legs were visible under the layer of mud under a layer of mud, but they were obviously just a result of being dragged across the ground. She was shivering excessively, which worried me slightly. It was lovely and warm in house. I hurried to find my needle and, and some thread and a bowl of hot water. She was semi-conscious still, mumbling something I couldn't understand, but she would be dead in a minute or for loss of blood if I didn't act fast. The cut had clearly nicked one of the main arteries, which is what was causing the excessive bleeding. It wasn't an easy job stitching her up. Her, her skin was as thin as paper and a thread kept ripping it, and it, to make matters worse, she was fidgeting. I could barely feel the needle. She could barely feel the needle, but I think her nerve ending. She could barely feel the needle, but I think her nerve endings were so damaged she couldn't feel the pain. Her arm looked worse by the time I'd finished than it had done than it had done when I started. But the bleeding had stopped and I was able to bandage it up. All we needed now was to hope that the bloody thing didn't get infected. I had nothing left to treat an infection. The girl with the messy white hair and skin as pale as chalk slept and didn't stir until the following morning. Ronan still hadn't returned from work. He was obviously far away on a raid, which meant I was alone. I hated this more than anything else in the world. And that is the end of the first chapter. Sorry, like at the end there, it got slightly bad with the reading. Um, I'd been distracted like two or three times when I was trying to read and it really put me off focus. But there you go, I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, the link will be down below to purchase my book. In fact, I'm going to put a couple up depending on uh, where you feel most comfortable buying from. And yeah, I think that's it. So on that note, I'm going to go. And so, so on that note, I'm going to go. So. Be kind to yourselves, be kind to others, and always take care. And I'll see you all very soon.